welcome in this session we are going to discuss selected systemic disorders in neuro ophthalmology which we have not discussed comprehensively in the previous sessions but we are going to start with a list of diseases which should be considered neuro ophthalmic emergencies and should be managed urgently they include giant cell arthritis intracranial aneurysm cerebral venous sinus thrombosis orbital apex syndrome and pituitary apoplexy we will start with myasthenia gravis and it is characterized by muscle weakness and this muscle weakness is variable in nature that is it occurs sometimes and it is not present at other times and this muscle weakness demonstrates fatigable muscle strength that means when the patient uses a particular involved muscle continuously the strength of that muscle gradually decreases Myasthenia gravis is caused by autoantibodies to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which thus reduces the number of available nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. The symptoms of myasthenia gravis are more in the evening after sustained and repetitive muscle action as I have mentioned and resolves with rest. Since it does not involve the muscarinic receptors, pupillary abnormalities are characteristically not found in myasthenia gravis. Sensory abnormalities are not present and pain is also not seen in myasthenia gravis. 50% of myasthenia gravis patients have ocular symptoms and signs at onset. So half of myasthenia gravis patients have ocular involvement either the lid or the extraocular muscles at onset of the disease and myasthenia gravis can be precipitated by various drugs and in the list we have corticosteroids, beta blockers, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines and others. The non-ocular signs and symptoms of myasthenia gravis include dysphagia, dysarthria, chewing difficulty, weakness of the extensors of the neck, the trunk and the limbs and dyspnea. It depends on the particular muscles involved in the disease process. An ocular involvement of myasthenia gravis may involve the lids or the extraocular muscles. So the patient may have ptosis either unilateral or bilateral and or ocular movement disorder with or without diplopia. The ptosis of myasthenia gravis is facilitated by sustained abgis and there is this important sign called Kogan lead with sign which can be elicited in patients having ptosis from myasthenia gravis in which when the patient refixates from sustained down gaze to a primary position or up gaze, there is brief over elevation of the leads. So we ask the patient to look down for some time and then suddenly refixate in the primary position or up gaze and we find over elevation of the leads for a brief period of time. Another sign is BN Fang sign and this is also a brief over elevation of lid when opening the eyes after squeezing them shut. Ocular movement disorder is worsened by sustained action in the direction of palsy. Here we can see a patient with myasthenia gravis having bilateral ptosis with ocular deviation. Myasthenia gravis can mimic a large number of other neuro-ophthalmological presentations including ocular motor palsy which can involve a single muscle or may involve all the muscles of one or both eyes. In case of multiple muscle involvement, it does not correspond to lesion of one particular ocular motor nerve. It can mimic supranuclear gaze palsy, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, saccadic dysmetria, nystagmus, and if we find orbicularis oculi palsy along with LPS palsy, that suggests myasthenia gravis. The orbicularis oculi is supplied by the 7th cranial nerve and the levator palpebris superioris is supplied by the 3rd cranial nerve and these two nerves the 3rd and the 7th do not lie adjacent to each other during their anatomical course from the brainstem to their respective muscles. And in a myasthenic patient with simultaneous orbicularis oculi and levator palpebris superioris involvement will have a drooping lid which the patient will not be able to squeeze shut further and as we have said pupillary involvement never occurs in 
myasthenia gravis. Diagnostic tests for patients with myasthenia gravis include tests which overcomes the muscle weakness and among them we have pharmacological tests, sleep test and ice pick test. Other tests which can be done in a patient with myasthenia gravis include serum antibody assays, electrophysiology of the neuromuscular junction, CT or MRI of the chest to rule out a thymoma and tests to rule out other autoimmune diseases. Pharmacological tests in myasthenia gravis include drugs which inhibit the enzyme acetylcholinesterase and when this enzyme is inhibited the amount of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction increases and this increased amount of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction can be sufficient to increase muscle strength by stimulating the reduced number of nicotine acetylcholine receptor in the postsynaptic membrane of the neuromuscular junction. Now this increase in acetylcholine also occurs in muscarinic junctions which increases the risk of the test as we will discuss. Pharmacological tests are indicated when there is a measurable deficit that means the patient presents with a deficit and we can measure the improvement in these deficits after the drug has been injected. Pharmacological tests are not usually done in an ophthalmological clinic because of the risk of cholinergic crisis due to overstimulation of muscarinic junctions. And the most serious side effect of this overstimulation of muscarinic junctions is heart block. And when these tests are done, atropine, a muscarinic cholinergic antagonist, must be available for emergency use or the patient may be pre-treated with atropine before these drugs are injected. So the drugs include adrophonium chloride and neostegmine methyl sulfate. Adrophonium chloride is injected intravenously and 2 mg is injected and symptom improves in 60 seconds very fast. And if no response is seen in 60 seconds, two more doses of 4 mg each may be administered in an interval of 60 seconds or more. Neostigmine methyl sulfate is injected intramuscularly and the dose is as mentioned here and it takes longer to act about 30 to 45 minutes and the action persists for a longer time which allows measurement of ocular deviation before the injection of neostigmine and after. This picture shows a patient with bilateral ptosis and extraocular muscle weakness causing exotropia and following neostigmine injection the ptosis and the ocular deviation has improved. Ice pack test and sleep tests are not associated with any risks and can be easily done in any clinic. An ice pack test is suitable only for patients with ptosis not for patients with extraocular muscle involvement in myasthenia gravis and the ptosis improves after 2 minutes of application of ice pack test by 2 mm or more. An ice pack test has been found to be sensitive and specific for myasthenia gravis. In sleep test the patient is asked to lie down for 30 minutes with eyes closed and following that the ptosis and ocular motility will be found to have been improved. Serum antibody analysis in myasthenia gravis includes assaying for anti-nicotinic acetylcholine receptor antibodies and anti-muscle specific kinase antibodies. There are three types of anti-NSCHR antibodies. We have binding antibodies, blocking antibodies and modulating antibodies. The binding anti-NSCHR antibodies are highly specific and are usually measured initially and if the binding antibodies come out to be negative in the assay then blocking and modulating anti-NSHR antibodies are estimated. Anti-muscle specific kinase antibodies or anti-mask antibodies are usually found in patients with bulbar disease who usually present with dysphagia or dysarthria and they are assayed if the anti-SCHR antibodies turn out to be negative. 10% of patients with myasthenia gravis are seronegative and in these patients if we still suspect myasthenia gravis the serology is repeated after 12 months or the diagnosis is revised. 
electrophysiological tests include repetitive supramaximal motor nerve stimulation and this shows decremental response in systemic myasthenia gravis. Another electrophysiologic test which can be done in myasthenia gravis is single fiber electromyography and this characteristically shows jitter and SFEMG of both the levator palpebri superioris and the superior rectus can be performed. Chest CT or MRI can show thymoma. 10% patients of myasthenia gravis have thymoma but only a small proportion of these thymic tumors are malignant and we must not fail to screen for other associated autoimmune diseases such as thyroid, SLE, NMOSD and pernicious anemia. Majority of patients presenting with ocular MG develop systemic MG usually within 2 years of onset and those having only ocular MG even 2 years after onset very rarely become generalized. Myasthenia gravis is seldom fatal and if that happens, it usually occurs in the first year after onset of the disease. Treatment of myasthenia gravis includes acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Pyridostigmin, which is the most commonly used drug in myasthenia gravis, is effective for generalized myasthenia gravis but may not be particularly efficacious in ocular myasthenia gravis. Steroids and immunosuppressives have a role if acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are not effective. And it has been found that steroids initiated at a high dose may cause substantial worsening of muscle weakness and so an alternative is to initiate with a low dose and gradually build up the dose. Immunosuppressives are indicated as long-term steroid sparing agents. Plasmapheresis and intravenous immunoglobulin is used in myasthenic crisis and before thymectomy is performed. Thymectomy is considered in systemic myasthenia gravis. Non-pharmacologic treatments include tosis, crutch and prisms. We should be avoiding drugs which can potentiate myasthenia gravis and lead and extraocular muscle surgeries are contraindicated in active myasthenia gravis. Other neuromuscular junction disorders are botulism which inhibits release of presynaptic acetylcholine and can affect muscarinic as well as nicotinic junctions. As muscarinic junctions are involved, midriasis and loss of accommodation occurs as well. Onset is more acute compared to myasthenia gravis and adrophonium challenge testing is negative. lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome is characterized by autoantibodies against voltage-gated calcium channels in presynaptic terminals preventing ACH release like botulinum toxin and it affects both nicotinic and muscarinic terminals. It usually precedes a diagnosis of malignancy, usually small cell carcinoma of lung or an autoimmune disease. In contrast to myasthenia gravis, in lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, muscle strength actually increases with sustained activity and high frequency repetitive nerve stimulation. However, the main ocular symptom in LEMS is dryness from hypolactimation, lacrimation being a muscarinic receptor activity. It may also cause ptosis and extraocular muscle dysfunctions. Congenital myasthenic syndrome is caused by genetic defects in the neuromuscular junction and they display, like myasthenia gravis, fatigable muscle strength. Among the selected inflammatory disorders, we have the Tolosa Hunt syndrome, which is an idiopathic inflammation in the region of cavernous sinus and superior orbital fissure. So it is not infectious, it is an idiopathic inflammation and there is recurrent attacks of ophthalmoplegia with severe pain. Pain is characteristic of Tolosa Hunt syndrome and is associated with ophthalmoplegia. Cranial nerve 3 is most commonly involved and fifth cranial nerve sympathetic and parasympathetic supply can also become involved in Tolosa Hunt syndrome. In sarcoidosis, facial nerve is most commonly involved among the cranial nerves. Optic nerve, chiasmal and retrochiasmal regions of the visual pathway can also be affected by sarcoidosis. We can find optic nerve at granuloma in sarcoidosis. Ocular motor nerve involvement can also occur and pupillary involvement in the form of Addy pupil, Horner's pupil or Argyll-Robertson pupil can occur with sarcoidosis. 
Cerebellar degenerations like Friedrich ataxia, autosomal dominant cerebellar ataxia and ataxia telangiectasia can present with ophthalmic symptoms like nystagmus, ophthalmoparesis and oculomotor apraxia. In progressive supranuclear palsy, we get slowed vertical saccades and weakness of vertical gaze and the down gaze is affected earlier than up gaze. We also find lip retraction, convergence insufficiency and square wave jerks. Initially vertical movements are affected but later on all ocular movements are paralyzed. In Alzheimer's disease we can get difficulty in color vision and contrast sensitivity. We can get abnormalities of saccades with hypometric saccades and saccadic intrusions. Visual agnosia and optic ataxia may also be present. All these have been discussed in their respective sessions previously. Arteriovenous malformations can be as serious as intracranial aneurysms and AVMs are congenital lesions sometimes with a family history and usually presents before 30 years of age. Unruptured AVMs are more commonly symptomatic than unruptured aneurysms and we may have seizures, headache, patient reported bruit and transient or persistent neurologic deficits. So here we see an MRI showing an area of arteriovenous malformation and on magnetic resonance angiography the vessels in the arteriovenous malformation are very well delineated. Occipital AVMs can cause unformed visual hallucinations, migraine-like aura and headaches but unlike migraine, these episodes always occur on the same side either left or right in occipital AVMs. In hemispheric AVMs, we may have homonymous visual field defects. This is a hemispheric AVM. Brainstem AVMs can cause diplopia, nystagmus, gaze palsy and light near dissociation. AVMs can also occur in the dura and they raise the pressure of the cerebral venous sinuses and the bruit of the AVM may be mistaken for pulsatile tinnitus of an IIH. Transient visual loss can occur from still phenomena but is rare. In a still phenomena, blood supply from other regions of the brain shifts towards the arteriovenous malformation. When arteriovenous malformations rupture, mortality is very high or there can be serious residual neurologic deficits. Workup of AVMs include MRI or cerebral angiography for unruptured aneurysms and CT scan to detect blood in case of ruptured aneurysms. Treatment depends on location and can include either excision, embolization or ligation of the feeder vessels. Coming to cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, they can be infective or non-infective. Non-infective cerebral venous sinus thrombosis can occur in pregnancy with the use of OCPs in hypercoagulability disorders or in malignancy. Superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, particularly when its posterior aspect is involved, can have raised intracranial pressure, seizures and motor deficits. Septic transverse sinus thrombosis can occur from otitis media and may involve cranial nerves 5, 6 and 7. And deep venous thrombosis is a serious condition if it involves the basal ganglia or the thalamus. What we are more interested in is cavernous sinus thrombosis which can also be septic or aseptic. Septic cavernous sinus thrombosis arises from infections in face oral cavity, nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses and the patients have systemic symptoms like fever, chills, headache, nausea and vomiting. There is orbital congestion with proptosis, lid swelling, ptosis and conjunctival edema. Please see a picture of a patient with cavernous sinus thrombosis as I could not find an unlicensed photograph on the net. These patients usually have ophthalmoplegia also and the 6th cranial nerve is most commonly involved. They can also have involvement of the 1st and 2nd divisions of trigeminal nerve, Horner syndrome and venous stasis retinopathy. And since there are intercommunicating channels between the two cavernous sinuses, 
unilateral involvement frequently becomes bilateral and this actually suggests that the pathology lies in the cavernous sinus. Cavernous sinus thrombosis from aseptic causes have a less severe presentation. Workup includes magnetic resonance venography, CT venography or cerebral venography and screening for hypercoagulable disorders. Treatment includes antibiotics for septic causes, antiplatelet and fibrinolytic agents, lowering the intracranial pressure, debridement of sinuses and re-canalization procedures. Orbital apex has a similar presentation as cavernous sinus thrombosis but in addition to it, it has second cranial nerve involvement with vision loss and RAPD. This is because in the cellar and paracellar areas, the optic chiasm and the optic nerves lie above the cavernous sinus and are not involved in pathologies localized to the cavernous sinus only. But at the orbital apex, second cranial nerve lies adjacent to the other cranial nerves namely third, fourth, fifth and sixth and are involved together. The most common cause of orbital apex syndrome is orbital mucormycosis which usually occurs in a patient with diabetes, particularly diabetic ketoacidosis. And in orbital mucormycosis, the adjacent sinuses, mainly the ethmoid, are frequently involved. And sinus and orbital exenteration is often required to save the life of a patient with orbital mucormycosis. In head trauma, it has been found that there is no correlation between residual ophthalmological defects and severity of traumatic brain injury. However, convergence insufficiency is the most common ophthalmological sign following a head trauma. Other ophthalmic deficits which can occur after a head trauma include accommodative insufficiency, unilateral or bilateral six cranial nerve palsy and traumatic optic neuropathy. These conditions have been discussed in respective sessions previously. Following head trauma, we can also find photophobia, disruption of fusion and visual field defects. Cortical injuries can cause visual inattention, agnosia and visuospatial deficits. Brainstem injury can result in pupillary abnormalities, nuclear and fascicular deficits and supranuclear disorders. Following radiation therapy of an ocular or periocular tumor, radiation necrosis appears like recurrence of the malignancy on standard CT or MRI, but a functional MRI can differentiate between radiation necrosis and recurrence of the malignancy. Radiation optic neuropathy can occur 10 to 20 months after treatment and presents with an acute painless visual loss. MRI shows a post-contrast T1 enhancement of the optic nerve, differentiating it from a tumor recurrence. Then there is a condition called stroke-like migraine attacks after radiation therapy and it occurs years after radiation therapy for intracranial malignancy and these patients have recurrent attacks of headaches, visual hallucinations, seizures, homonymous defects, hemiplegia, aphasia and the symptoms usually resolve within two months. Ocular neuromyotonia which we have discussed in a previous session can also occur after radiation therapy. Certain neuroophthalmic disorders can occur more frequently or more severely during pregnancy and they include cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, particularly the superior sagittal sinus and the transverse sinuses are involved, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, pituitary apoplexy, enlargement of certain tumors such as pituitary adenoma, meningioma, schwannoma and hemangiomas hypertensive retinopathy, hypertensive choroidopathy and hypertensive optic neuropathy and cranial neuropathies most commonly cranial nerves 6 and 7. Lymphocytic hypophysitis is an autoimmune inflammation of pituitary gland which also occurs during pregnancy and there can be pituitary dysfunction which may be permanent as well as visual disturbance in the form of chiasmal compression and cranial neuropathies. Treatment of lymphocytic hypophysitis includes corticosteroids and surgery. We will discuss myopathies and neurooculocutaneous syndrome in respective sessions later. Thank you for listening.